I'm reading from the Old Testament, 1 Kings, chapter 17, 2, and verses 17 through 24. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Today's gospel lesson comes from the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel, the 11th through 17th verses. Listen now to God's word for us. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son. And she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, uh, walking around in a robe isn't as easy as it might seem, Uh, particularly if you're a guy and you have minimal experience in a dress, these things uh, can get a little complicated. I've tripped and I've nearly lost my balance more than I care to remember. I have a friend who, uh, when climbing the stairs at the front of the church to the pulpit for his very first sermon, fell flat on his face. I thought that was bad until I heard about another poor pastor. So a younger pastor, not too long out of seminary, was officiating his first graveside service. You know where this is going. He lost his balance and it somehow embracing himself on the casket. Well, the whole thing went down under his weight him on top of it. So telling the story, another pastor who was telling it commented, now there is no graceful recovery from that. Unless, of course, you happen to bring the deceased up with you. That would be a feat, of course. Uh, Probably the only one liable to erase the memory of that sort of stumble. Uh, from people's minds, because it's extraordinary, it's miraculous to bring someone back from the dead. Yet today, we read of two such stories, one from Elijah and one from Jesus. And frankly, the stunning part of it to me is that, in a way, it all seems kind of ordinary to me. It's okay. 
normal, like standard fare for Jesus, it's not that surprising to me when we find this story. Oh yeah, resurrection. Even though it's a miracle, it seems like another day at the office for Jesus. For us, you know what's ordinary? There's nothing more common than death. It's the one thing we all share. Death is the persistent, unavoidable factor marking human existence. There's nothing more expected, more common. And even when a mother grieves for a son, there are countless mothers grieving sons, even now. It's a tragedy every time. Of course, 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, it was a little different than today. You see, on the day her only son died, this woman died. In fact, uh, per the custom of the day, the bereaved mother walks in front of the funeral procession toward the final resting place of death, the grave. Because in a way, it's her procession as well. And not just her sons. See, we hear often about motherless children. There's always grief and sadness when a child buries a parent. But a childless mother, that seems a tragic reversal. It's one of life's dirtiest tricks. When a child precedes a parent in death, and the parent has to bury their own child and see them travel from womb to the tomb. When he dies, a part of her dies as well. And in that male-dominated society as a widow, the death of her only son is an economic catastrophe. She would have no legal inheritance. She'd be dependent on charity because her economic well-being was dependent on the men in her life. It's more than a stock market crash. Her whole world has crumbled with the death of her only son. It was her funeral too. And what words of hope and care does Jesus offer the widow in mourning here? He says, don't cry. Wow. Okay. Now, when someone's crying, that's a natural thing to say, right? When my kids fall down, uh, don't cry, rub it up. Or, Or when they struggle, don't cry, try again. Or even in a moment of uncertainty or doubt in our lives now, don't cry, it'll be okay, we got this. And we get that. Because we want to pass along hope. That all is not lost. There's story yet to be written. Don't cry. You know when we don't say don't cry? A funeral. Can you imagine doing that at a funeral? A beloved mother lies next to her grieving children. And someone walks up and says, don't cry. A widow mourns next to her husband. Don't cry. Parents bury their child much too soon. Don't cry? What kind of a monster is that person? Can you imagine how hard it would be to hear that? The thing is, even then, even in the moment of deep pain, we want to say, don't cry. Because what we most dearly want to do for people who are in grief is to take away the reason they're crying, to undo whatever happened in the first place. Because we feel that even though we know tragedy strikes all around us, this isn't the way it should be, right? Of course. Even the one performing the miracle knew that. Because, you know, this widow is vulnerable 
and as helpless as she was without her son. She probably wasn't the only mother in town mourning a child that day. Only her son was raised. All was not right with the world. Even then, you know, he eventually died one day. You see, a miracle, a miracle is really just a glimpse of God's kingdom. They aren't God's kingdom. John calls them signs. That the miracles of Jesus are like arrows pointing in a certain direction. They aren't the destination. When Jesus says, don't cry, the scriptures say he said that because he had compassion on her. That doesn't sound like compassion, really. But that word there, compassion, See, there's a Greek word there. It's translated. It's like the feeling you get in your very innermost parts, like the pit of your stomach. You know, it, it, it almost makes you sick on someone else's behalf. The depths of your soul. Jesus felt for her in his heart of hearts. He had compassion. A few weeks ago, we mentioned the word companion means someone you break bread with. And today, I'll remind you that compassion is literally to suffer with someone. That may be an important lesson for the church today, particularly in the face of some who make grand claims as to the outcome of living the Christian life. Yes, the church does awesome ministry, in this world today. We do our work in Jesus' name, and, and as we do it, I'll tell you the truth, I've seen it happen. As a result of the church's praying, some sick people will be healed. Some fractured marriages will be reconciled. Some prodigal sons and daughters will return to the fold. Some Christian business people will succeed wildly and earn beyond their wildest dreams. And when these things happen, and when the church then praises God for answered prayer and for golden opportunities for the divine providence that makes it all possible, here's the thing. The church is not wrong to attribute those gifts and instances of grace to God because they are glimpses of God's kingdom where all will be well. But to get a glimpse of something better means that what we see, for the most part, is something else. Right? In a world where we all still attend the funerals for people we prayed for, in a world where some parents die without ever seeing their wayward children return, in a world where some perfectly conscientious Christian business people lose everything they ever had, in a world where not every prayer is granted, the most we can do is believe that Christ still has compassion for us, suffers beside us. That's actually what we're doing here. You know, remembering Christ's passion at the table of the Lord. Celebrating that Christ suffered with, suffered for us. Went to the cross on our behalf in order that we one day might catch more than just a glimpse of the kingdom. At the table, you come to meet with, to break bread with your compassionate companion. To celebrate the ordinary being made extraordinary. 
to celebrate that a path to resurrection is made available to us. Yet we know, even still, all is not as it should be. Tragedy is all around us. There's nothing that can just take away our sorrow. So you bring your heart to the table. A heart beset with grief and loneliness and weakness and pain to meet with your Savior. Who with all the love and with all the compassion in the world says words that are probably as difficult to hear as they are hopeful. It's like water. It washes out a cut, but it stings even as it heals. He says, don't cry because he knows something. He knows It's going to be okay. Amen.